Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third Simpson UK meeting of the 2021-22 series. Thank you for joining us. We've got nearly full house. Woo! And I should say many thanks to Andy Cuesta down here for organising this event. We would not be here without him. Okay, so let's just do some basic housekeeping. So there are no planned fire drills. So if the alarm sounds, you have two options. And this is with credit to um, John Zabriski, yes. Uh, run around in circles screaming or follow Richard's instructions, which are to exit the room in an orderly fashion, turn immediately left through the fire exit, which is signed, and proceed down the stairs to exit the building. And of course, many thanks to our hosts, the DTG. Um, it's, this has been a great evening so far. Thank you for the refreshments. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, the ample refreshments, which is, uh, which is the tradition of SIMTI. Um, and yeah, thanks for, for this, um, this venue and, uh, and yeah, for hosting us. So it's been really good. Now then, um, a few parish notices before we carry on. DTG, Richard. <laughs> Simty Fellows. So congratulations to Richard and also to Rich Welsh and, and Andrew Cotton who've been uh, elevated to Simty Hooray! Fellows this year. And there was an award ceremony yesterday evening. So um, yeah, congratulations for that. Um, so I'm, I'm Simty Chair of, U of uh, the UK. Uh, my name is John Ellerton. I'm um, in my day job, I am um, head of futures in BT Media and Broadcast. Um, and thank you, thanks to all of you for, for joining us uh, at uh, this event. Um, if you are a guest here, join up and join into Simpty UK. Um, it's really not very expensive. It's only 165 US dollars, 125 quid. It's tax deductible. There are discounts. If you're a graduate, just ask me. I've got some discount codes. And if you're a student, it's really cheap. It's only 15 US dollars, which is 11 pounds. And there's many benefits. Um, so, so come and talk to us and, um, and join up and become a part of this great organization. I'll be back at the end to talk about future events. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand over and let's get this event going. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, sorry, the microphones here are for the audio and of the video, uh, which I will be editing, so please be careful. Cutaways will be put in as needed. <laughs> so, Bill Lovell. I met Bill Lovell at Ealing Film Studios um, when I was a trainee uh, telecine assistant. Uh, this is where I learnt that sound guys are really awful. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that um, the guys that held the microphones and the guys that did the recording, the sound recorders, hated each other because they always walked in opposite directions. And you remember those Nagras, those tiny yeah. little Nagras? And that tiny little plug? I had yeah. to solder them together. Uh, and I met Bill Lovell there in, in the canteen once, uh, whinging about sound recordists. Um, but um, he was somebody that I really clicked with. And uh, Ari is the key here. Um, Bill. Um, was made redundant when Ealing Film Studios finished uh, and we got rid of most of the BBC, I should say now, because I'm not BBC anymore, got rid of most of the um, people that worked in the Ealing Film Studios, uh, went off to others. Bill went to Ari. Ari was the, the, the every, everybody knows what Ariflex is. Who doesn't know what Ariflex is? They're still being used. You know, how old are they? You know, 50 years old? Mm -hmm. um, and he designed their first electronic camera. And that's why Ari are still here. Uh, the Alexa, the Amira, and all the stuff they've done with, uh, since then is down to Bill's original designs. He designed from the backward upwards, not from the electronics downwards. He designed from the user, the operator, back up to what the operator needed in that camera, which is the only way you can do it. He came to meetings. He would ask a question, usually towards the end, that floored everybody. Uh, and it was really, really sad when we heard that he had passed away. And to honour him, we thought in the UK, how do we do this with the UK, new reopened UK uh, Simpty chapter? How do we deal with this? Let's put in place something that 
it's a memorial. Roderick's here, who's done something. Simon Fell's done something. Uh, Peter over the back has done one. Uh, you know, there are people here who have done these, the, these lectures. All they are is a celebration of the life of people in Simti. Uh, all of you are, uh, are potential subjects, by the way. And you, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Polly? <laughs> um, but there is someone who is supposed to be standing here. Not, not, this is not a, a Prin's issue. Uh, Prin was down for 21. Someone was down for 20. Yvonne Thomas was down for 20. Because she is now working for the DTG, she qualified as being someone in the UK. But, and I had a text 10 minutes ago saying, nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> she is due today. <laughs> so she actually did something that nobody on the male side can ever do to get out of doing one of these. <laughs> and we've had a conversation over the last few days. <laughs> that was <the laughs> this is the first time she has ever been late in her life. <laughs> Prince sent me his slides and I saw this link on the tube on the way here. So I managed to download it before we went underground and, uh, and in true VT style put together the package you saw on the screen over there uh, between uh, Baker Street and here. Um, and then I spoke to his wife while Prim was on the call. I don't know why you've gone white, Prim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say what we've discussed. All I'm going to say was she said this was very appropriate. <laughs> what can I say? So this evening is Prim's celebration of a life in the industry of Simpty. Uh, and I hope we can continue for a long time. It's all an obituary. <laughs> 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 I haven't had to do one of those yet. Uh, but so what we're going to do now is I'm going to pass the microphone over to someone who I can't even begin to pronounce his surname. <laughs> and uh, I'll come back at the end of the Q&A. So, Prim. Thank you very much. So thanks for that. And thanks to Bruce as well for um, a, a glorious introduction on, on, on LinkedIn about being, being a polymath. So. Um, I must say I do have imposter syndrome. I'm not sure why I got picked to do this. Um, I will try and make it entertaining for the for the lot of you. Um, I don't regard myself as a polymath. Um, I, my mother would say that I'm hyperactive, and and and, and Gina would say that um, um, I get bored easily and I'm on the um, autistic spectrum. But, all of which is true. I think I think it's 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 a bit better to say. So um, that's. <laughs> <laughs> all heckling welcome from all friend, friends and family. So, so, so. Um, so I, I've done a lot of things, um, that's, that's fair to say. Um, I've, and um, well, let's, let's have, a, have a romp through this. So I've been given an hour for 60 slides um, on, on, 50, on 15 <laughs> subjects. Um, he's taking time code points of edit notes. So we'll, 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 we'll take, take, take that and, um, and, and, and let's see how we go. So um, as you say, my name is Prinyal Songsenbun for the purpose of disambiguation. Um, I have a lot of aliases, just call me Prin. Um, my, my father is Thai, he's a Thai national, he lives in Bangkok, my mother's, mother's English. And, and technically, I still can't even say my name correctly because when my dad um, wrote down the English um, equivalent of um, tritone symbols in English, he got the A and the U back to front. So I can't even say my name properly. And, and so anybody who's, who tried to pronounce it, especially at award ceremonies and mangled it, you are forgiven because we're all on, on the same boat. So I was born in 1961, December the 21st. I'm hybrid Sagittarius Capricorn. I'm born on the cusp, the longest night for that. It's a, a, a bit of an omen. Um, so here's, a, so, uh, so, so, uh, um, here's me um, playing, with, playing with Brio. Um, my, um, I threw this one in, um, uh, particularly in the COVID years. This is measles, which you probably have, many haven't people seen. This is before the MMR in, 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 uh, inoculations appeared. Uh, you have a one in thousand chance of brain damage. It's a bit of a moot point whether it happened or not. Um, uh, and then I, I still have the, I still have the teddy bear. Um, first movie I remember is Dr. Doodle, The Great Pink Sea Snail, um, which has a push me, push me, pull you on there. And I really remember it because we came out of the cinema and it was in Morecambe and the lights were on. And I went, this is, this is what, kind of an earliest childhood memory. 
Doctor Who, yes, I was that child who scuttled behind the, the, uh, the sofa as soon as the music came on uh, from the um, telephonic workshop. And, of course, the moon landings, which um, you know, kept us all spellbound at the time. 70s, here's this fine oh, specimen, oh, uh, and the, there you can see. And um, to say it as a, as a bookish child would be an understatement. Um, um, <laughs> one, side, one, side, one side read everything in the house um, and everything at school. Um, my mum took me to take me down to the library and used to despair that I used to read sci-fi books. And then I came across this book by Isaac Asimov. It's called The Universe. I mean, what a title, guys. I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> from Flat Earth to Quasar. And, and it was a revelation because people wrote down how these enormous things in the sky um, that, that um, evolved, how the elements were formed, um, that there, I think there are six different atomic mechanisms of there, and also how you can understand the microscale from, from understanding um, astrophysics and, the, and, and, the, and, and all that goes on in, in the universe as well. And that juxtaposition of the macro and the micro is absolutely astonishing if you think about it. And, um, and this really captured my imagination and still uh, physics today, I, I still read phys.org daily to see what's going on in the industry and the like. But I didn't become a physicist. I work in television. Um, age nine, my parents took me down to the local uh, music centre on a Saturday morning and said, you need to learn an instrument. So I was going, OK, which one do I do? And uh, listen to flutes and oboes and everything else. And uh, for some reason, I picked a trombone. Um, so at age nine, <laughs> I started picking the trombone. It's, uh, I think I like strange, weird things. And um, the, within a week, I could make a decent sound. Um, within two months, I was actually on stage in, 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 uh, in, in Lancaster. Um, where uh, in, in front of an audience playing with uh, going red in the face with something that I had composed. And in my teenage years, I actually played in all of um, these um, particular uh, bands and the like. Um, Stories of Lancaster's at Brass Band. I played um, Gordon Langford's Rhapsody of Trauma at Burn Brass Band at the Preston Guild Hall for 2,000 people at age, age 16. Um, as part of the Lancaster School Symphony Orchestra, we did three tours to Salzburg, Sweden. And um, this one actually is Argentina. And so if you look on this, it says El Teatro Colón. That's why it's in Spanish. Um, the, in, while we were in Sweden, we played in the Gothenburg Concert House. Um, the Teatro Colón is one of the best five acoustics of any um, opera theatre globally. Um, and we were actually mobbed um, afterwards. So the, the, there was this 120-piece symphony orchestra. There's two 65-seater coaches. We're all teenagers. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, just a jaw-dropping experience to go, to go and do that. When in Argentina, we were in um, Buenos Aires, went to Cordoba, Mendoza. Mendoza. While we were in Sweden, there was like a three-week tour of the, of the area and, and the like. Um, I played in the uh, county big band and, the, and through the orchestra as well, um, I got a scholarship to um, be trained by Terry Nagel of the Northern College of Music. I used to go down there every Saturday once a month. Now, Terry Nagel is actually one of the most famous trombonists of his era. Um, he was the principal trombone of the Halley Orchestra under Sir John Barbaroli. And, and unlike um, this little individual here, he was a barrel-chested giant, and, and, and his, his projection was, was legendary, uh, as are most trombonists. So I was really not um, destined to be a, a professional trombonist. Um, More Than Eight was interesting. There was a, um, as a, as a local band, uh, which we again played disco covers. Um, set up by a guy called Mr. Moore um, and with, with some friends as well. And we, we usually had a, um, a, a summer season at Morecambe uh, playing twice a week um, on there as well. So I've done a lot of things um, with the orchestra um, and big bands and brass bands and, and, and everything else. Um, my parents are separated by then and um, my mum, bless her, obviously she had my sister took after. Uh, so she couldn't drive me everywhere. So I used to walk everywhere with my trombone, um, hitch around the, um, uh, Lancashire trying to do some of these gigs. And I think privately, looking back, parents were appalled that I was stuck in the middle of the, the Yorkshire Dales or somewhere uh, trying to hitch back to Lancaster at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely aware of people driving 50 miles out of their way to take me, take me home um, out, out of pity for, for doing all, all of this. After all that, I did not become a professional mu musician. <laughs> um, some of my friends did. Um, um, we were, went, went to see, uh, Gina went to see South Pacific, I think, and I looked in the orchestral pit and I went, hello, what are you doing there? And there's a, one of the cellists in the orchestras. Um, that guy there on the, the bottom left of that picture, Eugene, he ended up singing at Glyndebourne as, as, as a tenor. He's actually an oboe player at the time. Um, and um, Nick and Liz Mercer uh, got married and, um, and as did 
Uh, so there's a lot of people came out of there, and you, a lot with, with music as well, um, along with the other things I've done, people make long-lasting friendships. You stare at a lot of communal experiences with people, and, and they stay with you for, uh, for life. Now, one funny story about this is um, in Sweden, um, this is from Wikipedia, and if you look on here, the ferry ran aground on August 27, 1979, and all 587 passengers were safely taken off. So I was on that ferry, <laughs> <laughs> along with an entire symphony orchestra in two 65-seater coaches. <laughs> now, this was before the Herald of Free Enterprise. This is a roll on roll of ferry, and, it was, and according to all accounts, it was shipping 200 tonnes of water now. So we were coming out of Gothen, um, Gothenburg and in a 4-7 storm, and sitting in the, the canteen, and suddenly there's this grunching sound, and the whole boat started to... <laughs> And then there's another grunching sound, and the whole thing started listing, and every single plate and everything just went sliding off and crashing into, into, into a corner. And at which point, everything stopped. You go, what's going on? Oh, what do you do now? The whole boat's slipping sideways. And then, then this klaxon starts sounding, and you go, hang on. And I've read something, something about nine things, and he gets to start counting, he gets to nine, and then ten, and then eleven, and it doesn't stop. And then this Swedish voice says, Very sorry, we've run aground on Gurlfinger Rocks. And, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so they had to rescue everybody in a 4 7 storm with the, with the boat lifting at 15 um, degrees and shipping 200 tons of water um, an hour. Um, I think the rocks were anything keeping it up. There were two methods off the boat one was by helicopter, the other one was by um, life raft. So at uh, three in the morning, I remember opening the door to the superstructure and it's like something out of Close Encounters. This is blinding light, just noise, wind, and this is helicopter. <laughs> so, literally um, um, sat in the middle of the superstructure of this boat um, in a 4-7 storm and people were leaping from the superstructure onto this helicopter while the pilot hovered in there. I didn't go on the helicopter. Um, <laughs> so so, 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 so they, luckily, the, the boat was listing into the wind, and the, the rope ladders um, with the wooden rungs and things were on the, on the lee side of the boat, except they were all rotten. They started to break as you were going on there. So we ended up in a life raft and down there, jumped onto a pilot boat, and I, I remember watching the pilot drawing this. He's got d twin controls on the engine, and he's literally just doing this all the while, moving the boat in and out, everything else, and he navigates onto the line, Went onto a, onto a, onto a, um, got dumped there. A big ogre collected, takes it all back, and then you go, "What do you do? You're sat there with nothing, <laughs> just just your clothes you're sat in." And they flew us home. The, the irony was that there were some people on the boat who didn't like flying. <laughs> 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 and the other, the other memory I have is is somebody is a gibbering wreck now. They've lost everything they have. They're on a plane. There's their parent, and the the, the waitress. The hostess just gave them an entire tray of miniatures and just said, help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we landed at Manchester, got on a bus. Um, there's no internet, there's no mobile phones by then, those days. And I, I, I got home, I got a lift home, and I knocked on the door and said, hello, mum, I'm back. <laughs> Which voice she went apeshit. So, um, so, 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 um, so, so, the, the, uh, the, um, well, part of the band as well, um, there's, a, there's a couple, sorry, I lost me, me there, the, um, called the Froggets, who used to run uh, the band more than eight and um, were a, a climbing friend of ours and a couple of brothers, and I'm still very, they're like my brothers, in fact, uh, friends of the family. Paul Froggett became a professional musician. And we used to drive down to Bracknell, so I have a very eclectic um, vinyl collection of jazz records, which is very unusual for teenagers in the, uh, in the 70s. We actually went to the Bracknell Jazz Festival um, and went to about two or three of them uh, when Bracknell, believe it or not, had the most world-class jazz festival <laughs> globally. Yes, um, it stopped when um, the police pulled um, the plug on Wayne Short in the middle of a solo at the dot of midnight. <laughs> Welcome to Little Britain. Uh, but then again, you could argue the locals knew that. So, I mean, the, the people here you've probably never heard of, but they are jaw-dropping the best of their class worldwide and um, this is part of the sort of the, um, the immersiveness of, 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 of music that we're involved in. So my electronics, so my first ever electronic project, um, my parents were, were, were doctors by the way, my mum's a um, um, non-invasive uh, cardiology specialist, my father's a gynaecologist and my, my sister's a, um, an A&E uh, consultant as well. Um, but so my mum arranged got to do something, likes engineering, um, so 
Um, Peter Nelson and the tech support team at Lancaster Royal Infirmary um, helped out and it's my first ever project, so I made a metronome, which classic 555 counters and like, there's a, a pulse or, or, or a tone. And that enabled me to get an engineering scholarship uh, and a place at uh, this place, which is GC Telecommunications Coventry, as part of the a Thick Sandwich course, in 1980 and 1881, which of course is when the specials um, came out with, with Ghost Town. <laughs> so that was quite an interesting experience living in Coventry. Um, we actually lived in this building uh, for, for three months at the Grange. Grange. Now you know it, as it knows it well. As a, and, um, and the Grange is where the managers had their golf course. And it was absolutely classic, old school British engineering, well, British management industry. That Stoke works there. Uh, it's a training, training facility back, back of Spon Street. Spon Street, where they used to make Spitfires. They still have some of the, um, the machine tools there uh, from, from the Second World War and like. And I remember we used to go to different departments. So in one department I learnt, which is kind of maintenance and everything else, I learned to walk very slowly and do nothing all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Um, there's a... There's a <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is, um, there's another one. There's, remember a guy who told us, you know what, we'll always be here, we're going to be safe, we've got BT people on site, whatever happens, this company is going to survive or else. <laughs> and um, the, it is tragic that a company of this size and organisation, and at the time this was the, um, as, as the, as the pinnacle of, of, of the stock market in the UK, that was the culture and the attitude that was endemic in that company. And you kind of ask yourselves, what did we do? How did that happen? And um, there, there were some bright spots. Um, I mean, I, I remember, um, ironically, I helped install 140 megabit line systems, uh, which are actually outside my house um, in, in, in Reading, going, going, going down there. And you're, this is old, old Plesiochna stuff. So um, we walked down there, and the, the, the field install crew. And, there was the, and this was System X was just happening as well. So bubble memory was a big thing. And uh, the, was, the, the media was all, all full of this stuff. They had everything going for them, but they blew it through complacency. And, and that's something that has always stuck with me. Um, I, I stuck with it. I mean, there, there's some great things. They, they, I, I came out of, um, I went to grammar school, passed 11 plus a lot of stuff. I had 10 O-levels, 5 A-levels, one of which is music, of course. And I got another sixth um, A-level here. Um, we're doing electronic systems. They put us through. So in terms of training, it was great. But it's tragic with the culture of the company. I just walked away from it. It was not going to, it's not me, and um, it, didn't, it didn't happen. So I went to Birmingham University, um, and this is, um, of course, my first year. I basically done my first year already, and I was pretty bored, uh, to, be, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> so um, I, I got involved in, in this thing, so this, this, this Guild TV. So this is not actually the official sanctioned TV centre, but this is a complete student run organisation in the Students' Union, uh, which had run on a shoestring budget. Um, so um, this, this, those pictures actually, of, anyone recognise that camera? Um, that's year three, that's in M2001, I'll show you the year one and two ones. That's a VHS recorder. There's some picture of me um, as a cameraman um, being almost run down by a hunt supporter when we were filming some hunt, hunt saboteurs. <laughs> So that, that's the danger of wide-angle lenses when you're low down and, and vehicles are coming towards you. You, you quite can't go judge distances. Um, and everyone could pitch in and do, do everything else. So year, year one and two, we actually ran these cameras. Um, you'll recognise them as the grandstand camera. It's a Pi Mark V. Four and a half inch image orthcom black and white. These are valve. This is an entirely valve system. Uh, we had a cable system around, around the, the, the building with a bunch of black and white televisions, which had the 405, 605 line switch, which we'd have to solder into the 65 position because everything had oxidized. Um, they, they started out with, the, the, uh, with, with turret changes in year one. Year two, um, this is the year when the Beeb were actually selling or getting rid of lots of gear. And literally about half a mile from the place, there was a, a junkyard who sold TV bits <laughs> from, from broadcast, broadcast equipment. So um, we had a small budget um, from, the, from the union, um, and year two, we, we fitted those zoom lenses. Now, um, we didn't have any proper pedestals or anything, and that zoom lens is heavy, <laughs> really, really heavy, and you could not back off the, the centre of gravity and do this. So the only way to fix that was to acquire, let's say acquire, lead weights, um, lead bricks, in fact, uh, from the... Um, and, uh, the 
um, the old cyclotron. Um, so I'm one of the few people I know who have actually filed and, and, and hacksawed lead, lead bricks to use as counterweights um, to, to counterbalance the cameras. But, um, but you could actually get um, pretty sharp pictures out of these things if you could find the right patch on, on, on these, these. This is a CRT in reverse. I'll, I won't go into... If you want another lecture for another hour, I can tell you how these things used, used to work. So year three, um, for some bizarre reason, we decided to go colour. Um, and so this, this is actually a picture of um, the, the, the galleries we, we put together um, and with ME 2001s, which, as everyone, whoever knows, worked on ME, is, is a four-tube camera. Red, green, blue, and a luminance tube. Very, very rare, very, very unusual. And if you thought racking a three-tube camera is bad, a four-tube camera is an absolute <laughs> night nightmare um, to do. Um, Going back to the, the previous ones, these things were so unreliable and we didn't know what we were doing that we, we used to do a live program every, every Friday and we wouldn't even know how many cameras there were <laughs> until about five minutes before going on air, and in which case you'd have to juggle the, put the that camera doesn't work, put it there and, and, and move it around. So you've got quite, quite adept at, at doing this. It's live production, it's got to go on. So, um, so just talk about PAL in those days. Um, I mean, originally we had a Frankenstein bus where a composite was brought onto this, and we had, went, went electronic, had wipes and a whole bunch of things. My, I programmed up my BBC Micro to do a, a, um, a, a, um, a, a GTV 3D graphic in, intro, which we never synchronised, or we always used to clunk and click around. But the, um, uh, who knows what, a, what an vectorscope is, and, and there's the little <laughs> dots on the, vector, on the vectorscope, the boxes. So those boxes basically are related to these days, they don't mean very much. In those days, they mean a lot. And in those days, you need to time up your system to within a degree of subcarrier of any path. Now, a degree of sub subcarrier in coax is about that long. Every single, and there's no gen lock. So the entire reference chain from your source, which by the way is all nat lock equipment, distributing around there, every single star distribution of every single piece of cable has to be timed to within that distance all the way down the chain according to the, the propagation delay of everything in there, along with all of the parallel cables and everything else. So we had not a clue what we were doing when we started, and so some of the um, people came back um, who, who graduated, Dave Thomas and, and Richard Storey. Um, so if you're listening to this, guys, thank you. It's great fun. Um, and over a summer, we put this together somehow. I have absolutely no clue how we did it. Um, and we actually went live with snooker with uh, Steve Davis came along and, and gave a live uh, snooker match. Um, bulbs are popping and things. You need quite a lot of light, light for these cameras. Um, and um, the irony was I spent a, a week hacking through the air conditioning to, to the bank um, under, underneath um, the, the, um, the studio in order to divert some cooling into this. And I, and I, uh, and I, and I, I spent the summer um, spending my, what little money I had on the studio and I had to go and ask the bank manager for a grant to, uh, to, to cover, to cover me until my, my, my next paycheck came through. So um, and he did actually pay, give, give me the money to carry through. He said, it was a bit noisy up there, but he, he, he forgave me. So um, you, can make, you can make this stuff. 82, um, so there were three, three of us. Um, in fact, this guy here, on the left is a guy called Mark Andrews, who um, MC knows, you may remember. Um, in, in myself, there was um, Nick Birch, Boone, and Dave Bryant from alphabetical order, and we used to sit and do mechanical drawing together all at university. Um, so Nick dragged us down to, to Glastonbury in 1982. You notice it's, it's C and D in those days. Um, you notice there's a little band called U2 <laughs> wasn't even main, mainlining on there. Um, Van Morrison and Judy Zook. Judy Zook, love and affection. Oh, that was fantastic. Uh, they had lasers. That was brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, 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 um, so um, as wide. And so we, I've been to about five Glastonbury's over, over the years. But um, um, you two then, and you two at Twickenham's it last year, they have an 8K LED wall now with the, the, <laughs> the Joshua tree on it. So things have come on, but it's still a great entertainment. And basically... I think I love live music, and I've, I've played it for years, and I will go a long way um, to, to do this. Very, very different days. You may notice there's a, a, someone stark naked standing up in the middle of that crowd, cr crowd here. Um, so you, you can't do that now. And, then, and, and, um, and in those days as well, you could break over the fence. People, people were, were dressed, dressed, dressed in uh, black bin liners to keep themselves warm. Jesus, and, that's <laughs> 
I said, no, no, I took the photo. And, oh, I says, um, the, uh, these days, if there's steel fences, there's Chelsea tractors and everything else. Um, one year they had people who made a car henge. <laughs> and and all, those, all those vehicles at Mad Max, they'd made them like 10 years before, for real. They, they'd be great big um, um, sort of... Um, ribs coming out of these things and, and in, in the mist there were the beating drums with the Mohicans on coming through. It was just a um, bright light just pumping the way through. through the, it, it's a fantastic time. Um, a real huge ex a joyful experience everybody. Um, finally a project, back to some electronics. So um, I actually tried to make a, 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 a frame store, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> um, that's an old A to D, 8-bit A to D that I've still got. The, the genuine ones were actually the three times that size. These days they're like a one billionth of a, of a, of a corner of a chip. Um, it didn't work, of course. Um, and in my final year, I also got glandular fever, um, just to, which knocked me out for three months. But I really did not want to um, go back and do another year. So I have a third class degree. Uh, after, after all that, <laughs> this is, this is, uh, which um, when I worked for Dolby, um, actually, the, Tony Spath who hired me, he got a lot of pressure from, the, from, from HQ saying, you're hiring some of the third? What, 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 do you, what, do you, what, are you, what on earth are you doing? He said, bear with me, it'll, it'll be worth it. So um, if you, any students who, who are shuttling through this at three times normal speed, by the way, because that's, that's what you do these days, <laughs> don't do that. It's not a good idea. It, 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 you, you won't get away with it in, in 2021. So um, from there, I'd um, um, caught the adverts and, um, and um, saw this company called IVCC, who was kind of, kind of doing um, advertising for jobs, and um, went down for an interview, and uh, met somebody called MC Patel and, and, and Sim, Tim Gale. So M MC's here tonight. So MC gave me my first job in the industry. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. I have a third too. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> we worked on a, a number of a number of different projects. It was a great time, and we, there, there's a we, everyone worked hard and played hard. Um, I, I kind of end up specialising working for Tim, not doing the core products as all the young Turks wanted to do the exciting digital stuff. So, this is the kind of stuff I worked on, and this is a board that would actually fit in the slot of, of that Xeno. This is the, this is um, this is an analog PAL composite decoder, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> from, from that time, which, um, which you can pass around if, if, you, if, you, if you want. So that, that thing is a glass delay line, uh, which, which video is, is modulated on in, um, uh, to, to audio frequencies and, and bounced around there. Um, so it is, it's, a, it's a technically comb decoder, uh, not non-adaptive, non uh, and those are all, all delay lines in, in the same way that you time up everything to your, your less than one degree of subcarrier. So that's a... Um, there was a... MC and Tim started a project which was um, to do with a field-based um, stand. Um, we'd done 2D effects. The idea was to do 3D effects, a bit like, um, like, the, like Mirage could do, but at a central price. The project was called Cruise. And basically, um, there was a merger with Abacus Video Systems with, um, I've got his name now. <laughs> Phil. Phil, Phil, Phil Bennett, who who's, we still uh, talk to on an ad hoc basis in, in, in San Francisco. And um, MC convinced him that this is a, a field-based 3D warping engine was, was possible. So the project got cancelled, <laughs> and the A53D got formed. Um, Phil had Dan uh, Berlier, who's actually one of the, um, again, one of these genius American um, R&D engineers. And um, myself, Mark Andrews, and Pete Smith got farmed out to San Francisco uh, for, for six months, basically, seven months to, to work on the project, which was great. <laughs> A summer in, 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 in California. It's like your dreams. Um, so some, some, of the, some of the girls came to deliver us, uh, to, 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 to visit us, who were, who were friends. Um, Pete actually married one on the, on the, on the, in the end, as Pete, Pete and Sue Smith. Um, I went rock climbing in, in Yosemite. Um, there's a story, actually, I forgot my rope. I had to buy a rope in Yosemite to go, to go climbing, which is a bit embarrassing. Um, went whitewater rafting, wine tasting in, in, in the Napa Valley. You name it, we experienced it. Um, joined the Royal Rocket Club to play racquetball and also do aerobics with Californian girls dressed in, uh, you, you, you get, a, get, a, get, a, get a picture, um, playing Simply Red, look at me now. Um, it was a dream. It does happen. Um, so, so it came to an end, and um, uh, so I moved on, and I ended up um, at, at Abacus Cox in Feltham. So uh, Mike Cox had 
kind of just left the company. We're all part of the Carlton, Carlton Group, which you know, Simon Fell was, was also part of at the time. And you may be aware of the T8 was on there, and we, um, that got morphed into a product called the Arena. Um, this product, the, the DMG 1000, was known as a Piero, um, to basically, and it's actually the forerunner of the Piero used today, I, I, I actually think. think. Um, and we've gone now from the era of, we've done black and white, valve, we've done colour, and we are just starting uh, colour composite, colour component, and the, the, the T24 for BSB was being invented. Now, and we also had the Cox Coda, which is famous. Now, again, what was absolutely shocking was that the Cox Coda was built to model. There was no diagrams for it. <laughs> no end those circuits. There were two people who knew how to build one, and they had the bins in front of them, they had a model in front of them, and uh, the bay board, and they knew how to put this stuff in here, make a Cox coder. <laughs> and that's how it was done. It is just a gigantic cottage industry. And that was held up as the pinnacle of how we built products at, at that time. It's absolutely shocking. And, it's, and it's, it's unsurprising we've ended up where we are now. The T24 um, basically shouldn't have happened. Um, there was a, there's this mad... Um, uh, Glaswegian uh, wireman who, who fundamentally what he used to do was take these chassis together and they were wired with ribbon cables. He was sending analog component video up ribbon cables um, and just extending them. And he used to bolt these MEs together to make this, this enormous thing. And then he used to document what he'd done <laughs> after a 15 hour shift. And that lot was shipped to BSB and Simon and the others, a state of the art. Completely unscalable. Um, that arena mixer um, there, um, the engineers who did it got fantastic bonuses and then all buggered off basically. Um, the whole thing, when it got shipped and landed on site, was a pile of bits inside. Every single button on that control panel uh, had fallen out, the, the, the lights hadn't, wouldn't, 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 wouldn't align or anything else. I spent four months redesigning that entire surface with light guides and everything else to make it shippable and manufacturable. That is, from an R&D perspective, what can go wrong. And, and, and the other thing I didn't say in my intro, actually, is that, you know, why am I here? I mean, you've had people who are, um, have formed companies like Roderick, um, though, who have been um, directors of the EBU and VP of Standards. I've never run anything in my life. I never started a company. But I do represent, if you like, um, a lot of engineers in the industry um, the, the, the Tims and the Sandys and the, and the Richards and the and, and, uh, Ian's and the Dan here as well, who's, who's to work with, and, and, and the others. We make stuff under the hood, and we do our best to make it happen. But the systems and the environments in which we in, have, have worked have been, quite frankly, shocking. Absolutely appalling. And um, there, are, there have been bright, really bright guys who are very, very creative in putting together. And it's, it is uh, tragic that that's not been um, better exploited, if you like, or, or developed in, 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 in this country. So um, during all this time as well, um, when I was at Coventry, um, I, I started climbing um, uh, with GC Telecoms. Um, we started buying our gear. Again, used to hitch everywhere, had people, um, had motorbikes, so we used to um, go up to North Wales on there. And um, one time, I remember Eugene, he bought a tent in a pub on, on Thursday. We hitched up to have the city on the Friday. Um, and um, the, the Saturday morning, the guy came to collect some money, looked at his tent, he said, don't bother, guys. You, you, you just, this, this thing was such a wreck. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't even worth bothering charging us, us, us for. So I used to climb, I used to train twice a week and go away every weekend, um, cadging lifts of cars, bikes. Or, or hitchhiking around the country. Um, this is one of the most magnificent places in Europe. It's the second deepest gorge in Europe, the deepest ones in Crete. Um, this gorge uh, vertically is somewhere between 250 and 750 metres. And if you're standing on the Belvedere at the top of here, the Epron Sublime, it takes a paper dart about five minutes to circle round and, and go, go down. Um, those are my hands after a week of, of climbing there, doing, doing a vertical mile. And, um, and one of the routes I've done literally goes up, the, up the, uh, this face, goes along there and, and, and climbs out at the, the top. Um, that particular tree that you see, that dead stump, is actually pretty crucial. Um, it's part of a, a route called Lunabong. 
And um, in, those, in, in Britain, we have what's called traditional climbing. We put bits of metal in, in cracks and things and, and, and with on, on bits of wire and, 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 cram- and, um, and, bar- uh, and, and clip into those. And, and if, they, if you fall off, you hope that that's not going to pull out, which is a roll of the dice. Um, continental climbing, they put um, expansion bolts into the rock. Now, in those days, there was no power drills, there's no battery drills and everything else. So you have to bear in mind that these expansion bolts are hand bashed into the rock. You are lucky if they went in by 10 mil. <laughs> 10 mil's a long way. And so the anchor point at the top of that route, which is about half a kilometre vertically down there, is two bolts, a bit of limestone with, with, some, with some rings on there, which you know are maybe 10, maybe 15 mil deep. And you know that thousands of people have used them, and you don't know when they were last re- replaced. <laughs> so you put your two 9 millimeter ropes on, on that thing, leap off. Now, in the U- in UK at the time, we used 45 meter ropes. In the continent, they use 50 meter ropes. So your rope is five meters shorter than it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> that particular tree is a nominal 50 meter from, from the top. And the last 15 metres of that are in free space because you are above the cave. Now, normally when you abseil, you tie a knot in the end of the rope so you don't fall off the end. But when your rope is five metres short, <laughs> if you do that, you're not going to get to the end of your rope. So you end up in free space, about 300 metres off the deck, with about that much, it's about two degrees of subcarrier, <laughs> in your right hand, a hand bite. And you're in free space. And that tree is crucial because with your left leg, you can just about kick the tip of it and start swinging in. And the only thing keeping you alive is your right hand on here, which is very sweaty by that point. And you, what you do is you swing in and you grab the tree with your free hand, not letting go with this one, pull yourself in and then, um, and then tie yourself in, stop panting and then shout out, so you can't hear you anyway because that is free to do. The other exciting thing is that there's all these swifts flying around the place, and they love diving vertically down the cliff place. <laughs> so you are, you're sat there going, what are you doing? And it's shh, what was that? And so, so, as, you, as you go around this thing, and it is atmospheric in every possible way. So I saw that for fun. That was great. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, so the other thing, by the way, is um, these things, if um, anyone has done any flying, they're called Charlie Bravos. You know them as thunderstorms. Mm-hmm. And actually one of those scared times I've ever been was at the Verdon um, when one of these things came in and it started to rain. Now limestone when it gets wet turns to glass. It is like vertical ice. Now we were lucky at the time it was overhanging for part of it so we were dry. Um, what got really scaring was our hair started standing on end because we were in the bottom of the thundercloud. <laughs> you are tied to 150 meters, after you're tied to 50 meter rope, 150 feet, you're carrying 20 kilos of metal and you're attached to the rock face and your hair standing on end <laughs> and the only way and there's no way down you can't go down the only way is up into the cloud base discuss that's it <laughs> um, done a bit of ice climbing this is um, on, on, on the Ben um, I did not do the thing on the right uh, we did the thing on, on, on the left um, but I haven't done very much actually they well I, I tend to concentrate on, on the, the rock climbing and my um, partner then David Souls um, used to um, then go out with Jeff Tier and others to the Alps in, in the summer. So it's never really my thing. Um, ice climbing is one of these things where you, you do it, um, it's horrible at the time, and then you go to the pub and tell everyone how fantastic it was afterwards. I mean, that's, 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 so it's their turn, they can go and suffer. Um, but I mean, there are people who specialize this and the like. So um, now, all these shenanigans and motorbikes, ice climbing and else, does have a, have a downside. Um, so Martin um, Herbert actually. He died his 19th birthday when we were in Coventry. I was sharing a house with Martin at the time at GC Telecoms. Um, he's on his motorbike, I said. Um, somebody just, a uh, nervous breaker, um, stopped at, a tr- at some traffic lights and he went to the back of him, um, died at the operating table. Um, Dave Webster and Sidcock, a random strap for Mont Blanc. Um, the two significant ones, um, well, very significant ones, were Jeff, Jeff Tier, who uh, died with Paul Nunn on um, Haramosh 2 in, in the Karakoram. Um, uh, Paul, Paul Nunn was a major um, climber at the time and um, Jeff and Gene and myself went to um, his um, leaving dinner um, on there and he said that was, that was Dave Sol's partner. 
the really significant one for me was um, the, the Denali Alaska event with Chris Massey. Now, Chris was um, kind of an expat in the oil industry, He'd come back to, to the UK and lived, lived in Reading. And I'd spent a lot of time climbing with him um, down in South Wales at, um, at Gogarth and Pembroke and the like. And he invited me to go on this expedition. Um, and I was 26, 27 at the time. I had no alpine experience. I'd bought some gear. Um, I was pretty fit. But I kind of backed out at, the, the, um, at um, about four or five weeks to go. The three of them went out there, and none of them came back. So it is simply by the roll of the dice that um, I am standing here today, f fundamentally. Um, if perhaps it's there, they wouldn't make the same decisions, but to be honest, we probably would. Um, you know, you, we stick our necks out and do these things. Um, and all I say is that all these people enjoyed what they're doing, and they lived their lives to the full. And um, I would encourage anybody who's listening to this um, at, do, do the same. Don't necessarily push the boat out that far. Things, things happen, but you know, go for it. You're only here once, and you know, make, make the best of what, 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 what you've got. This is, this is a, this is so moving on, back to, back to the um, so this is <laughs> So um, I end up um, uh, working for Avius Graphics for um, a while with two um, amazing individuals, Glimpal Evans and an one called Ian Fletcher, who's still in the industry and uh, you, you may be um, very familiar with, with, who works at Grass Valley, is now the father, father of AMP. Um, Avis Graphics at the time made, made character generators, um, which were rebadged, um, fundamentally, um, Acorn Generation 2 BBC Micros. And Glyn is just a genius. We used to, these things used to come in with the keyboards. They used, to, they used to employ students to take all the caps off the keyboards. They then put all the, the right characters for them on, put them on, get them reprogrammed. And we talk about you know, people zooming everything else and, and working distributed in these days. Uh, we had a little outfit in, in Farnham. Um, there were people in Israel. There was somebody in, in, the, in the south coast, the son of, up in Birmingham, all contributed to this at the, at the time. So we, we just used to do this um, um, as per normal. Ian Fletch um, was one of these rare individuals who, uh, he actually ran an edit facility uh, place. Um, he used to make training videos for British Rail and, and that kind of thing. And he could also program. And he said, this edit control is just rubbish. So during a holiday um, on, on a beach somewhere, I don't know if this is thought about this, he wrote the basic edit controller for Omnibus. So um, VTRs in those days had ballistics. He, the, 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 um, uh, the profile uh, disc recorder had um, zero start. He, he wrote all in. And that started Omnibus, literally. And, and Glyn being Glyn, he's the, he's the G of, of PAG batteries, by the way. Um, he, he bought that bus. Um, he was equipped out as a, as a demo system and, uh, and was a teacher on the country. And, and, and the rest is history. So that was the foundation of Omnibus. The company moved to the Midlands. I didn't really want to move up to the Midlands. I was about the time heavily involved in, in the Thames Valley. Um, and um, so um, I ended up um, working for a gentleman called David Crawford. At RE Technology. Who, um, um, this was, is it Akron? Is it, uh, Akron started. Akron started, and then Ari, Ari bought them out. So they used to make sync pulse generators. Um, and so Ari made contribution codecs. Um, and there's a very famous project called 34, 34 megabit codec, which, again, with my kind of PAL experience, um, and this is my first time I met Andrew Cotton and, and Nick Wells, because we need to make a PAL NTSC decoder that could take it to pieces, be compressed, and then on the outside of the, on the other side, reconstruct the PAL in a, in a complementary manner, back to back, so that what went in came out um, through the telco network in the middle. There's no, you couldn't genlock this, there's no GPS, there's no global PTP or anything else. You had to resynthesize all the, all the input clocks on the output. It's basically very complicated stuff to do, and with PAL, with that much tolerance in, in, in your timing, um, it's quite challenging. Um, one of the things we did invent at the time was the 10-bit the, the trick for, for, for MPEG, if you may, may remember. And I asked you guys a question. I was saying, well, you've got this 8-bit DCT, and you've got this 8-bit... Don't those LSBs mean something on there? And they went, no, 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 no. And, and then about three months later, he came back and said, yeah, they do, actually. And, um, um, and, and, and so with 8-bit with, with eight, 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 eight residue, uh, with 10-bit I.O. to your DCT, you can get a 10-bit result on, on static images. Now... As all these codecs were measured in their signal-to-noise performance with static images, 
<laughs> they work brilliantly uh, for that. And so we, um, I used to take, uh, we, so we used to do our development there, and we used to take the whole thing over to Sweden once every three months and, um, for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for a couple of weeks, and then, then we go back again. And, um, and the Tivoli Gardens, fantastic. If you have ever been there, they're, they're, this is kind of the, what they have in, in Europe, is thing we don't have in the UK. We used to have it actually in Vauxhall, I believe, in, in the 18th century, um, but, um, but this is still a tradition out there. And there's a brewery, um, the microbrewery starts at Tivoli Gardens, and we spent, we spent the several hours in there with our, our Danish colleagues, and we, we came out, and there's a, there's a zebra crossing in, from the Tivoli Gardens to this brewery. And at nine o'clock, there, there was a collie dog walking an elephant across the zebra crossing <laughs> from the Tivoli Gardens <laughs> to <laughs> across there. So that's the only time I've ever seen <laughs> A collie dog and an elephant on the zebra crossing. Um, so, uh, it's certainly in it's Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, now, I have seen, I've seen elephants in, in Bangkok and, and the like, but, but uh, ne 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 never in Europe. Um, the 155 megabit synchronous digital, hearty, uh, signal digital hierarchy codec is interesting because that was part of the energy um, network which was providing contribution circuits for the BBC. And they wanted to send PAL three times per hour sampling through these SDH hierarchies. Now, synchronous networks, you go, oh, it's great, it's everything's synchronous, everything's fine. No. <laughs> because think about synchronous networks, it's synchronous within its zone. Mm. When you go into another zone, then you have a thing, you have to make up the time difference between the two. In television today, we call it a synchronizer. We mm. drop frames and repeats, or we what is sample rate convert. At packetized systems, you have a thing called a pointer justification event, a PJE. And that can introduce up to four uh, packets of dis time discontinuity in it. And when you're trying to reconstruct PAL at the end of the system, that means your subcarrier <laughs> jumps, jumps around. So believe it or not, in order to develop that, um, they had to modify the PAL I specification, which had been stable for something like 25 years. And they had to put a max rate of change in for PAL subcarrier, against which they could then work out um, the model, the, um, the number of point of justification events that statistically would happen in the network, because it's a, a random feature, and the, the very bright guys in, in, in Denmark could figure out their adaptive time constants on their, on their clock reconstruction in order to swallow these, the statistical distribution of PJEs in order to meet the new specification so that your television didn't blip in terms of its colour. Not a lot of people know that. So <laughs> <laughs> Some of the projects, we had digital headphones, which, um, um, which John Emmett started, so John Zion's here as well, which um, um, he made a simple box that was very reliable, um, and I turned it into something which is complicated and unreliable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we in a well-meaning way, and I think Dave eventually forgave me for that. And um, he had got the contract to build the BBC Nikon uh, equipment as well, which was um, a major, major piece. And the other person who um, David employed, along with myself, was a gentleman called Greg Bensberg, who's... Ah. Um, who um, he was employed to do um, AES uh, three uh, type work. Greg eventually came on um, to, um, to to be the Ofcom re regulator, <laughs> and, and is now um, I believe the um, general manager of Digital Three and Four. So yeah. this, is a, uh, this is a um, we've some history uh, between us all here. So I ended up at Stelbocox working for um, a, a guy called David Lyons, who was again in Roderick's presentation as a. Uh, one of these engineering gen geniuses, I would say. Um, and after a number of things, I ended up um, running what was, what was loosely called the Display Group. Um, this product at the top is, is called the Interpolator Gold, uh, which is the uh, Mark II version of the product called Interpolator, which Joe Zara and Joe Kane started, which basically took all of our professional scaling equipment. Um, and in those days, this, that thing at the bottom right is a, is a Barco 9-inch CRT projector. And in order to achieve a 10-foot um, a image on the screen, you need to invent lines because you don't want to have gaps between the lines on there. So we were having to create TV standards which had got nothing to do with the input standard. We, what we wanted is something where the point distribution function of each of those lines overlapped in a way that um, gave you a seamless image without overlapping, sorry, and, 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 therefore, and therefore making the image soft. So that was called display optimizations for analog. 
this latest presentation for digital. And that's one of the things we, we did there. Andrew, by that time, had been hired to work on the MPEG side of things, but I was working on the display side. And, um, and we built this thing, and, the, 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 and it, the first one was ringy and everything else. And, uh, um, and I got involved. And um, we redesigned all the clocking, um, digital filters, and the analog filters um, in order to end up with a, a, a set of responses whereby you had this smooth image delivered what it, what it said. Um, and that was sold uh, to top end home theater systems um, across the world, normally in North America. So um, basically, in the 80s, if you were going to spend half a million dollars on your home theater system, in the 80s, <laughs> well, in the 90s, then this is the box that you would have. Um, we even built a um, a, uh, an encrypted serial link to go into uh, top-end DVD players in order to bring back a digital interface to this like. And, um, and you could even colorize the, uh, um, the user interface, the control surface, and integrate it with the question on AMX systems to match the decor of your, of your, of your home, the home theater system. Um, this is Durford Mill. And such a system was installed in the barn at Durford Mill. And Bob Stewart who was the CEO and founder, co-founder of Meridian Audio, provided the sound system for it. So we had a 10-foot screen, 9-inch barcode projector, and a sound system um, installed personally and maintained by Bob Stewart, believe it or not. And Bob is just a, a fantastic guy. He, he came in and went, our tweet is out of phase. I'm going, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and lo, it was, and it was duly fixed and everything else. And, and, um, we, and that was uh, and pieced together. And, Bob um, is now promoting a thing called um, MQV, I think is the, MQA is, this, is the piece. And a lot of the techniques that are um, relating to uh, the edge shape in girls in MQA are actually video related. And we kind of, when well, I saw him, we, we kind of joked about this. He said, you, yeah, you video guys have been doing this for years. We've, we've just starting to adopt this in the, on, in the audio world. And, and, and maintaining the pulse shape and everything else, that, that, that click of the drums and everything else, is actually key, a really key component to delivering um, realistic sound um, in, in the way that we used to. We get, we get that um, in, 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 in real life. And, uh, and Bob has kind of, you know, this is osmo osmosed into his thinking. Um, and that is still very much uh, state of the art. Now, this bottom left here is supposed to represent um, uh, another project that um, Roderick set me on. And there's a gentleman called Brian Terrell, who was a, was a friend of Roderick's. Um, and this was, I mean, all, all, all this te scalar technology was fundamentally based on a chip developed by IBM. IBM, or in, in conjunction with Stella Wilcox, and IBM was, had thrown out scatterguns uh, like half a million dollars to about 15 or 20 different projects, and one of them was to build a, a deinterlacer scalar with, with, with Stella Wilcox. So we had this chip, it's about, about yay big, um, which I think they put too much bore on in, in the, uh, when, they, when they did the run, it actually ran at, one on 150 percent of its uh, specialized of its specified um, clock rate, um, so that was great in terms of video processing, and we could um, and we could generate all these um, images that we need. Unfortunately, the I squared C bus on it didn't work properly, so it was absolute nightmare to control. You had to, and 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 a, and a readback of it was destructive, so you can never quite con sure what what this thing worked at. It's technology, right? That's how that's this this thing worked at 150 megahertz, but they couldn't make 100 kilohertz I squared C work. What we did as well is that Brian Terrell, um, Brian was um, from a family that knew the Phillips families personally, I believe, they, they grew up with them. <coughs> Brian, again, was one of these genius um, original engineers. Um, he was part of the original missile uh, program for ICBMs, I believe, in North America. He had some of the first um, JK flip-flops that were um, invented to, to part of those. He, in fact, his, his business was designing um, 16 phase um, generators for, for military aircraft. Um, that was, and, um, but Roderick somehow persuaded him to try to build a state-of-the-art 42-inch um, CRT that could run at um, 1280 by 768, 60 hertz, using domestic television components from the Philips catalog, <laughs> to which Brian had access because of his, and we spent 18 months building this, this telly. These, we had these Mires tubes with a Picoma correction and special coating, which were built in bell jars at this big. Um, I'd actually ruined my back carrying these darn things um, because they were really heavy. Um, and I used to drive down to Rennes about once every three months to 
to, to, to Brian to uh, see how he's getting on and, um, and trying to, to build the two to everything else. CRTs are quite hard to, to make. Um, if you make a CRT in the Northern Hemisphere, you can't take it to the Southern Hemisphere because of the Earth's magnetic field. Will mean that you'll never be able to, to, to correct these things. So this, this is the, these are the tolerances to which we're working with in, in, in the Earth's magnetic field. It's mad. We, we made hundreds of millions of sets this way, and, and the people who did that um, were you know, there to be applauded on their knowledge of, of how these things were, were put together. Um, we actually made this. We did, we did demos. Um, uh, John um, Watkinson is here uh, as well, and um, he, had his, um, a, a, he built a, 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 his K-bar um, speaker, which is a, um, a big um, tube, piping tube with um, um, capsules at the end of it as well. And so we gave early surround demonstrations with um, 1280 by 764 50p progressive television demos um, as well as just a proof of concept as to what high-end television in your home immersive could be in the late 90s. The rest is history. It didn't go that way, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but it was, um, that's, what, that's what we were doing at, at, at the time. And um, the other thing I got involved in, um, oh, was, was um, I got, um, uh, was, was married, um, I was, was mortgage married in 30. My wife, Gina, is, is my long suffering wife, <laughs> Gina, Gina is here. And um, this is the first child, Cara. Um, so the, the, the story about the twinkle in the eye. So about six or seven years previously, J, JPEG 2000 had, had come about. And um, this enthusiastic sales guy turned up and said, I want to show you something, guys. This is, this is brilliant. And um, he brought out this, this photo of a baby. And, um, and he said, look at that, it's perfect. I'm going, what do you mean it's perfect? And he goes, look, that's fantastic. It's 100 to 1 compression. And I looked at his picture and went, well, it's OK. It's, it's a, and what do you mean? He said, what do you mean it's OK? It's perfect. And I said, well, can you show us what's missing? And he said, OK, I think I can do that. And he went along. And what was missing was the twinkle in the baby's eye. The interest from the photograph had been destroyed by compression. But it was perfect. The YPSNR said it was absolutely fine. <laughs> the CPSNR didn't care about luminance anyway, so it did, <laughs> and, and, um, and, and all was well. Um, I was speaking to, uh, is, it, is it Peter Boyd? Um, the risk of name dropping who? And if you don't know who he is, he's the guy who graded all of Lord of the Rings and, and the Harry Potter movies. And he was at, at Dolby and Soho. Um, uh, regrading those for high dynamic range, and he he just um, done Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. The, the, the one scene at the end, all these flashing and bangs and everything else. And I had to bump into him and um, so up the courage to say, "How's it going?" And else he says, "Oh, all this these special effects, these everything else." You know, if the thing that really interests me, he said, is, is getting the highlights in the face and the eye on there. And the thing about technologists and everything else, we we really do forget about, we don't understand what matters to the creatives and what we throw away when we send it through these systems. And the systems we have to measure it don't even understand that today. We're still, and um, today, don't, don't get that. Um, when when um, um, MPEG-2 came out and we had mobile and calendar and Keel Harbour Zoom and all that sort of things, I remember, is it Nick Lodge saying that 25% of all the standard material on ITV was harder to compress than the worst case sequences used to train MPEG-2. Yeah. That is still the case today. High dynamic range is even harder. We are still struggling to understand what matters from the twinkle in the eye, from a technological point of view, in order to preserve that. And so that's still, if you want, want a project, anyone listening on there, think about that. So um, um, I stopped basically climbing at this, this time. So Simon, um, Andy's alluded to the, the, the video on the, on the outside. And, uh, and I joined this band called Chain Gang, which, are, which is a, um, at the time was a, a soul covers band, mainly doing sort of commitments and then classic um, soul numbers. And there's about seven of the people there. Um, I played the Chain Gang for uh, over 21 years in, in the end. And I, I, I stopped playing them. Um, three years ago, which is ironic because um, this is um, actually on um, the uh, Facebook page of a, of a, of a, of a local um, 
pub um, or cafe, the jazz cafe in, in, in Reading um, advertising the band in, in, in two months' time, which you, of course I'm not, not a member of, uh, but, um, <laughs> but I'm still featuring heavily on there. Uh, and um, I was involved in this. I ended up running it for five or six years at its peak. Uh, we had 16 people on stage. Um, we went from um, old-fashioned analog um, um, uh, with an eight-channel desk, uh, we did, which didn't have phase inversion on the mic. So when you've got 16 people on a, on a, on a small club stage, you've got all the cross-talk and everything else. It's very hard to get a good live recording to what you can do now. Um, what was in normally a £60,000 desk 20 years ago is available for under £1,000. And you can mix it on your iPad in the middle of the audience. I mean, that's how, that's how far things have, have changed. Um, we, uh, we did uh, two Silverstones for, for Jordan. We have paid on stage with Ed, Eddie Jordan. I had to rig his drum kit uh, in order to do it. He dragged Brian McFadden along. We did, did four numbers, no rehearsal. No, we just, just, just pitched in and, and, and did that. And, and um, some of the players, like um, Chris Gore and, um, and Dave, the bass player, were playing in the 60s. Uh, we're playing soul in the, in the 60s and 70s the first time around with bands coming across America. Um, Loz um, was on the books for Sony, Sony Music and um, auditioned for Beautiful South. Um, some of the singers um, went into, went for a laugh, went to, onto the X Factor and got to the top 40, but basically were too old in order to get on, 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 onto, the, onto, the, onto the screen. So there's a lot of talented people around. They really, really are. They're just not going to make it for whatever reason in the industry. And we were lucky enough to, to, um, to have those people in the band. Um, there's a guy called Rob Rose, who's sadly passed away, who um, he was uh, playing in ska bands in, in, in London in the, in the 70s and 80s. And he had an amazing collection. And um, so the, uh, um, like, Blame on the Boogie, in fact, was started out by a, a UK guy called Mick. Jackson, not Michael Jackson, sorry, Mick, so Mick Jackson. And I actually prefer the brass arrangement from, from that. One thing we used to do in terms of doing covers, uh, covering covers, is we used to um, get together and create section numbers and then, then distribute those. And I did notice that the band used to respond better to some versions of a, a disc than, than others. And what I figured out in the end is that they responded badly to MP3 versions. And it's, it, it is uns unsurprising, I guess, in, in retrospect, but it is sub entirely subjective. The, 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 whatever that was part of the mix or anything else, I mean, this is entirely unscientific, but it's just an observation that um, when we were trying to cover a number, they were more enthusiastic when we were playing the non-MP3 version than, than, than the MP3 version. So just understand that what, what, has, had, what has happened to... <coughs> we're applying a lot of transistors and, and, and um, processing to these, these things. So another thing we got involved in as part of the display group was um, LED walls um, uh, at the time. And the blue LED was only invented in, I think, 1998, 1999. And um, the, uh, the, there's a company called Lighthouse Technologies in, in Hong Kong um, who were taking our original uh, vision scalers and, um, and liked them, basically. And there's a guy called Tony Van Der Ven, um, who's part of that, who's part of Cree Research, who invented the blue LED. And one of the things that we did is actually put together um, the very first ever high-def LED wall using a five millimeter pitch um, LED. Um, this is a, a piece of it. Um, it was built, it's built in a cow shed in Belgium in the middle of winter. Um, it took, takes, takes three phases to drive these things. They're very, very high powered. Um, each of these, are the, and this is pretty normal these days, but this is pretty stately at times. That's encapsulated an RGB um, LED in there, uh, which is chosen for um, it's, 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 it's colorimetry. Everything matters on here. Even the bond wires to the LEDs have to be mirrored, have dummy ones on the opposite side, because otherwise you get shadows from one angle or, or the other. So every single mechanical aspect and electrical aspect of this thing matters. Even the arrangement of it matters. If you're offset by even half a millimeter, your optical vernier acuity will detect that offset in, in, in the array and, 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 and you'll object to it. Um, this thing here is um, quite primitive by modern day standards. Um, it's 14 bit linear light. Modern day systems are 22 bit. So that's how far we've come on. And you see all the stuff that's going on there. Um, LED walls are made in handy 25 kilogram lumps and, and, and you, you assemble these things through. And our job was to make display scalers for um, these LED walls, which can be any size and shape because they are made out of various lumps. They're not 
1920 by 1080. And, um, and, and what happens these days is that in these, these VR sets, the, some of these things are 20K wide by, you know, one and a half K, K tall. And your st standard um, graphics engine can't drive all that for, for VR work, nor can um, a single playback engine drive all that. So um, I think it was an eSports um, happened in, uh, event happened in um, Iceland uh, about a month ago. They had 44 channels of 4K driving the LED wall, running in parallel from 12 servers. And that wasn't even a VR act activation. When you're doing VR, you have to generate a virtual background on a 20K by 1K screen in real time, <laughs> mapping to your, um, mapping to your, 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 your camera. And you, uh, one graphics card can't do that. So you have to build a 20K by 1K graphics card out of sub 4K various graphics cards. And so you have to build an array of graphics card and field all the partial parameters of that 3D engine world, 3D UT engine, into that array, that, which is all IP connected in order to construct the final resolution part. That's hard. <laughs> but there's a few companies in the world who are actually doing that today, and that's, one, and that's, that's, that's ongoing. Um, going back to sci-fi, so um, it's kind of in the press about the metaverse, and this is Neil Stevens. It's got a book called Snow Crash. Um, the predecessor has got Neuromancer, so this heavily influenced The Matrix. Those are, these are my copies. And um, they came out in 84 and 92. And these, the, these were the original pre-runs of the, what's called the metaverse. This week at the NVIDIA um, Global Technical Conference, um, this is the um, avatar of the, of the CEO. Um, all these faces on here are synthetic. They're not real. And this here is a, 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 a simulation of a, of a digital twin of a factory. And what they're doing is that they have digital twins of the robots that deliver packages in the factory on there. And they train the robots as to the best algorithmic way of going around that warehouse in the digital twin world. So when the robots move into the real world, they carry on doing what they're doing the best optimized way. The robot does not know whether it's in the digital twin world or whether it's in the real world. That's the matrix in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're also using this to train uh, or to work out how to, dis how to align 5G antennas in, in real world cities. They have digital twins now, uh, Ericsson's uh, having digital twin of, of cities, working out where the 5G antenna is going to be. If a vehicle is driving through there, what is the best placement for these antennas that gives you the lowest energy to deliver best, best coverage on there? Which is something which is very akin to what we do in television planning, just taken to a completely new level. This is now becoming routine in 2021. We are at the beginning of a completely new era. Some light reading colorimetry. Um, this is photographed this morning of, of some of my. Um, this is an amazing book uh, by Mark Fairchild. Andy um, and myself are on an on a, on a email reflector um, uh, with, with, with Professor Fairchild. I'd love to meet him and have a conversation one day. Um, this is, um, so this is, talks about how, your, how the eye responds in different conditions why when you're at the beach everything looks more vibrant and colourful um, and when you're in, a, um, in, in, in winter and ice climbing everything looks dull and, and, and it's, called, it's called the hunt effect, but it's not. Um, Peter Barton in, in, um, is his PhD uh, that put together um, the understanding of, of um, how many bits you need in order to avoid banding. And this is Alan Roberts' book, uh, Circles of Confusion, uh, which he um, was an amazing pioneer. Um, uh, the, the, the forward actually is a rather gushing forward, this is for myself. Um, one of the things Alan did when, when Planet Earth came back is that the um, National History Unit team had lots of different types of cameras and they would take them away and put them in deserts or ice cold conditions or humid conditions um, for three years, bring them all back and then people like Andy were expected to make a programmer out of all this, from all these different cameras. And, um, and what, An what uh, Robert worked out how to do was to, was to normalise these cameras in such a way and, and given the settings uh, to all the, um, the, the camera operators, so that when they brought them back, they had enough of a common look and feel that it was possible to process them to create planet Earth. That is genius. Absolute, genuine genius. And he taught me a lot about how these systems work and, and, and putting it together. Um, went to digital cinema. Um, so I got involved in the... Um, 
Uh, this is a book by Glenn Kennell, who was part of the Digital Ad Hoc Group. And, and at the time, this is the, the, kind of the problem. This is the, um, the mesh here is the 3D um, convex hull of, of, of a CRT. And this is what cinema, uh, with its um, colour negative, um, um, can, can produce. And of course, the two don't match which is why you need to grade from one to the other, and it's why cinema creatives get upset when they have the CRT version and, and, and the rest of it. And that fundamentally is, is, is the problem. So um, with huge thanks to Matt Cowan, Ron, Brad Walker, who he did all the... Um, he was the engineer who basically built the entire Texas Instrument DLP head uh, for, for digital cinema. Glenn, Chuck Harrison, Jim Houston, who sadly passed away, Howard Luck, who, if he's, he's in Cambridge right now, if, you've, if he's got back from his rehearsal. Um, hi, Howard. George Doblov, who um, um, uh, also made a fellow um, th this week, uh, Arjun, and, and others contributed to all of this. And this is the, the STEM material. And one of the things that... Um, I'll, so this is a kind of simulation of what you, what you do if you, um, if you change the primaries on the projector. Uh, this, is, this is how it should look, and, and this is how it how it looks on, on that projector. You can argue you like it, but it's not what the, the, the creative intent was originally. If you change the um, display gamma and um, make it higher and lower, this happens, and if you, you change the, the colour temperature. Now, the other thing um, about, about all of this was the word digital started to be kicked around in a way that I didn't really understand, because we were with digits for years. What does digital mean? And now it's, been, it's turned into a noun. We have you know, digital 360, we have OTT. You know, we, we, we know what. We have people whose title is digital. <laughs> uh, as an engineer, that's, that's, that's completely meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, the thing that took me a while to understand about the film community complaining about digital came to fruition with the examination of the STEM material. And there are a bunch of film techniques, like soft focus on the talent, where you, you don't want to have them in... It's, it's impolite of the people of a certain age to do that. And you kind of focus on... You do soft focus, which means the background's kind of focused, but it's film, so it's... If you do it in, in with, a digital, with a digital camera uh, and, a, and a, a Zeiss Prime lens and everything else, what you get is these very sharp focus bricks. And, and, and the face is blurred, and you go, come on, guys, focus on the face, which is... But that's not what they want to do. Digital is an extremely hard, brittle medium to a creative. It is unforgiving. It is brutal. And it also, imply, it also applies its own characteristics in a way that people who are used to working with film, which film's not great in, 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 from an um, electrochemical point of view. It's, it needs a lot of TLC and everything else, and Paul, <laughs> Paul's nodding enthusiastically there. Um, but they learned to master it. They did. Um, I went to see the, um, the third ever print of Patton, um, um, which was shot in uh, 70, 65 mil reconstructed um, at a, at a theatre in, in, uh, in, in LA, um, which was so dark inside, you, I could barely crawl my way along to, along to my seat. It looked glorious, absolutely glorious. The, the, deep, the cloth detail um, on, on his. Um, uh, uniform, the medals and everything else at the start of the, um, and, and, and the skin tones and everything else. We would struggle to emulate that today, even today, with the state-of-the-art systems, I, I would suspect. So there is stuff we have lost, and, and people still miss that. And so the word digital and what we've done, we still don't understand fully today. Just bear that in mind. A bunch of standards came out of that, um, which we worked on. Master characteristics quality environment, students level, and then the other, one of the funky things I worked on was, was uh, encryption links for one and a half gigs uh, for, for, for cinema, which is based on what now called AES was, was Rindle, so the, these new encryption formats had only just been, been invented, there was, a, there was a big shootout for the different encryption ones, so that came out of that work. Um, and then after a, a number of years um, with, I mean Roderick will tell you that the stories of multiple cutbacks and everything else, that I finally got hit, um, I got moved into um, a, a, a spin-off from Snell, uh, which eventually got um, bought by Dalit in the end. But um, come, come, eight, come the year 2008, when the, um, the big crash, I got booted out. I ended up working for Ofcom on Aiden McClearance, Clearance, where so Spectrum's complicated as, as we go along on there. So we learned about that. But I managed, uh, that was quite a successful project, and I think we came in at a half-price budget. And then we moved on to Dolby. This is HDR. Um, so 
John Watkinson was in this car, um, <laughs> um, along with a, a state-of-the-art Grass Valley camera. Um, so we got John out first, and then the quarter million pound camera and else. That's the wife's car, um, so she just said, um, glad it was you, not me, and, um, and can I have a new car, please? So she's, uh, she drives today. This is um, Valencia 2014 in November, uh, the MotoGP there, and that's the first ever outing of the Grass Valley HDR camera. Um, that's Jöran Roth, the, the sensor designer. Um, Klaus is there, he's giving a, a, um, a paper at the ATC um, today on their... Um, on the sensor, which is two generations ahead of the, the one we had there. That's Euron's um, um, desk. This is um, New York, Macy's Fireworks, 4th of July with uh, Chris Seeger Comcast. That's Andy at um, the, um, the um, America's Cup. This is the Women's World Cup in Vancouver. That's some hockey which we shot there. And this is obviously Wembley. We did a lot of experimental shooting in order, many, many genres, many weather conditions um, around the world, and then learning how this worked from the, from the ground up for life. And we also did parallel work on, on audio. Martin Black's in this picture on, on there. So that's us. There he is. This is on there. Mick Dwyer Schippal. This is doing live Atmos um, at the sky. Um, Sandfield Mike's 5 um, 1 production with Dorna um, and also um, how to, to get live capture for, for motorbikes, um, which on a, on a, on a um, live sound capture for motorsports is notoriously. Um, difficult, and um, we, we kind of digitised this. Chris Watson, um, I was at that time also uh, uh, chair of the Audio Engineering Society for the, for the United Kingdom, and somehow I persuaded Chris Watson to come down and, and give a, a lecture at the Dolby Theatre on there, and um, we got permission from David Nathanborough, because Chris is um, Dave's sound guy, to give a talk about um, the, um, it was the third ever showing of this, when David Nathanborough went into Scott's hut, in Antarctica, about 10 minutes before the, the, the film crew arrived, and he gave a, a piece to Mike for about four minutes of just as sat there what his experience was of, of this. And we're in the state-of-the-art Atmos Cinema. It's got more speakers than you can you can you can um, count. Um, you can pan objects and everything else. And uh, and we just played this piece in glorious big mono, <laughs> and the, the audience was spellbound for the four minutes. So. It's not necessarily about the technology. The technology allowed it to be reproduced in a glorious way, but the content itself was mono. Yeah. It was immersive. So again, think about that. That's a very, very different thing. This thing is a Schweppes um, 3D OATF cross, and this is a Soundfield mic um, designed by a guy called Peter Schilebex. The precursor for this was lashed up by a guy called Felix Krukels, um, a Lavo, who's now um, a professor, um, in, in, in Germany, and we call it Felix Helix, and that is eight microphones um, in a, um, a three-dimensional um, RTF cross, which HBS prefer, prefer for, for height capture. And this is um, bolted into, with, with Martin Black's help, into all the Premier League stadiums in, in the country. So we're, uh, there are lots of experiments in, in sound capture uh, for immersive audio, which led to the deployment of, of Atmos Live in BT Sports and now in... Um, and also in, in, um, in, in Sky as well. Uh, but we're still yet to get to um, the personalisation of audio, which you want there. On to Fabrics, my current job, product manager. This is me. This is, um, this is 2110 now, moving on to the IP world. Um, this is the JTM testing in, in, in Houston. I just got a call, actually, about how we can start planning the, the next event um, next year. Um, so this is where we're in, into networks now, and, and interoperability is key. So everybody has to get together and plumb in and see whether your stuff talks to that stuff. But it's very hard to build these systems at scale in order to deploy them to you as broadcasters until you've done this, because you simply don't know what's going to work with what. There are so many variables in, in these systems. Um, we've also condensed this down to literally, this is a 2110 system which will fit in that bag, and I have taken this to States, and I can build a working fluent system with PTP in under five minutes. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done this here to a few demos. So you can actually make it that simple, but fundamentally this is quite complicated stuff. Um, the HDR work we talked there at Dolby never came to um, any deployment permission, but Andy here determined, was determined to stay with it, and we ended up, I think in 2019, 25 different venues we did, matches and everything else in, in terms of training up everybody. Um, 
Liverpool won. I'm a Liverpool fan, born in <laughs> um, and, um, and we ended up, um, that is the return feed of the HDR transmission to a phone. It's PQ on there to your phone. Um, HDR, SDR, return from Madrid and, and the shaders. And basically we put together this thing which is called um, closed loop shading, which is the HDR is actually quite simple to do by itself. HDR and SDR at the same time is really, really hard. <laughs> HDR and SDR at the same time with a crew who then next day will do SDR for the next three weeks and then they're coming back again is even harder because everyone's forgotten what happened. So we had to work out how in order to modify existing trucks in a way that allows you to do this, do the same at the same time <coughs> and not modify current working practices. And it looks like something like this. <laughs> what can possibly go wrong? Um, so part of the 25 gigs that we did, matches and the like, was to go through each of these pieces of fine tooth comb and tweak them and adjust them, not only that in the truck, but also that for transmission. And Andy and, and BT Sport went live with their ultimate service um, in is it, um, August 2019, which I believe is Europe's, and I think it's outside of Japan, is the world's first ever high dynamic range um, live service on, on, on event basis with simultaneous live S HDR and SDR production from a single production flow. No two trucks, commercially viable, deployable, and deployed in 2019 with um, using, using the closed loop technique. That evolved into Here's the first ever international remote single stream version, which was uh, done in, from Porto in Portugal on there. Um, for reasons that, which we won't, I won't go into, we had to rig this in a day and a half. The point was, stuff happens. And the point was, is that because we'd already knew how to do this, and because we weren't modifying the equipment practices too badly, we could rig this in a day and a half. And we did. And it went out. And, um, and, uh, was, and, and worked. And then, to c then the final evolution of this, which um, I wasn't involved in because by that point, these guys were all trained up. And this was UEFA, for the very first time, allowed two things. One is remote production, and also uh, they allowed the SDR to be derived from the HDR. And that was, a, again, a tribute to um, the trust they had in the workflow that had been put together and tried and tested. And that went live for the, um, uh, the champions uh, the Super Cup um, in, in, in from Belfast um, early, early this year, um, and that's kind of the, what was what's piecing that together. So that's how far we've come. Um, this thing here is some work we're doing with Rivermax. So if you look at it very carefully, this this is a Windows PC. This is screen one. That is screen two. This is a 2110 receiver. This is the de desktop extension of that PC. All you do is install the software, extend your desktop into a virtual <coughs> 2110 monitor, and anything you drag or expose to that desktop appears as a fully timed 2110 flow using standard NVIDIA NICs and graphics cards. So I'm involved in helping to debug that right now. I've got a, my, my job tomorrow is to put the latest combination of stuff together and and, and, and give the feedback on them. That's a similar thing we're working. So they've got Linux version of Rivermax, um, and the Rivermax display with Windows 10 is, is, is this set. All your LED wall systems using, are using Rivermax and NVIDIA graphics cards today. Um, one of the things I'm working on is a PTP Yang data model. It stands for the next generation, but <laughs> this is to do with PTP monitoring. And we also have, apart from our day job, all this other stuff going on, uh, going on in SIMTI as well. And then finally, it's a hybrid world, but it is still just television. Again, this is from Andy about their, their startup project, how they brought everything back together, but everyone was still distributed. And now we have all of this hybridization. As I think someone said on the call yesterday, um, we still have a lot to do. <laughs> there is still much work to be done in order to deliver this at cost with the latencies required in order to put this together. So, um, that's it. <laughs> okay, sorry for the overrun. No, no, no.
What can I say? We, sim to UK, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And Prin, thank you for your presentation this evening. What an incredible career, and clearly, as you say, there is still much, much more to do. SIMT is an amazing organization full of amazing people, and Prin is one of them, and Bill was one of them. Moving forwards, what are we doing over the coming weeks and months? The next SIMT UK meeting will celebrate the next generation of giants. We're meeting at Sky Central Cinema, thanks to Keris Hughes, who's, uh, who's putting this together for us, on the 9th of December, to celebrate young innovators and emerging talent. So come along. Polly will be doing a little Q&A, and we'll have some, what, what are you calling it, lightning talks from some of the young innovators in our industry. It's gonna be great. And around that time, we've got IBC, and many of us will be there. SIMT will be there. So if you can come to Amsterdam, come and meet us there. In the meantime, the ATC is running right now, but it, re it really is running right now. Um, and if you've signed up, <laughs> um, take part. <laughs> well, indeed, yes. You've missed, so two, e two evenings have happened already. Uh, there's another one happening right now, and three more days next week as well. It's an amazing conference. Sign up and do what I've done, which is to invite some of our young talent to sign up and be part of it. If you're a student, it's free, and you get free SIMT membership as a part of it. Uh, it'll blow your minds, because there's so many amazing talks, but take part in this. So look, thank you for coming along to this evening. And thank you to those of you who are watching this online afterwards. Um, Simta UK is going from strength to strength, and we look forward to seeing all of you at future events. For those of you here, the bar is still open. <laughs> so do a bit, of, a bit more mingling. And courtesy of the DTG, let's have a drink or two together. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>